Hello and welcome to Eclecticist. Eclecticist is an investigation of everything from a British and an American perspective by two humans who consider themselves to be relatively normal people. And we do this one topic at a time. We are me, Benjamin DeCampos, a designer and believer. And I'm coming to you live from Southern California. It's not live. I know. And uh, well, it's live as in I'm talking live. <laughs> Uh, And Jeffrey Campos, an engineer and devil's advocate who is in North London in the United Kingdom. Jeff? Hello, listeners. We choose a topic of interest, we spend a little time researching it, have a discussion, then we publish the notes. You can read these notes on our website, which is eclecticist.co.uk, if you want to follow along in the program. And we do this uh, to foster a greater understanding of the world before we die, and hopefully to prompt further thought and discussion from our listeners. The topic we will be discussing in this episode is the very best of Stanley Kubrick. By the very best, um, we've kind of shortlisted three films that we think uh, are his greatest works, um, and they are 2001 A Space Odyssey, A Clockwork Orange, and The Shining. Whenever we see lists of greatest anything to do with cinema, the name Stanley Kubrick will almost certainly be there, and his paragraph will have words like innovator, meticulous, control freak, freak. He was freakish in the level of interest he would take into what he was working on, finally crafting every second of celluloid whether it was to appear in the final cut or not. His attention to detail and absolute perfection would win him frothing adoration from movie geeks and bemusement and incredulity from his actors and crew. And what of the box office? Contrary to popular assumption, his movies never initially set any records, nor were they critically acclaimed. In fact, it's fair to say that the three movies we're discussing today were slow burners, with the possible exception of Clockwork Orange, but that was withdrawn in the UK and only existed in notoriety until Kubrick's death in 1999. Just a moment. Just a moment. I'm detecting that I've reached the desired word count for this intro text. Well, I think we should start with uh, who Stanley Kubrick was. Who actually was he? I think probably everybody on the planet has heard his name, but who was he and what did he do? So he was born in New York City in 1928. I think he was born in the Bronx. I guess in 1928 was probably like maybe a pretty horrible place in New York City to be born. So maybe that had something to do with why he he left um, the US, you know, early on and emigrated to the United Kingdom for at least the last half of his life. But in his formative years, he was a photographer for Look magazine. Yes, um, I think... uh being a photographer is quite key to being a filmmaker in general. And I think all filmmakers probably would benefit from having an early formative period as a photographer. I just think, you know, you then see the world in terms of cinematography and photography and composition. And, uh, you know, everything is through a square or a rectangle, which is particularly relevant to 2001, which we'll get to. Uh, So I think it helped, and it certainly was along the lines of what Stanley Kubik wanted to do and be. I think it would set the trajectory for his filmmaking and uh, set the path for the rest of his life in terms of work. And uh, I get the impression that he was a severe workaholic and an absolute perfectionist. Um, He was married a couple of times, I believe. Um, He had three daughters, uh, one of whom have subsequently died, I think in 2009, I think it was Anya Kubrick died when she was 50, I think. Um, And uh, of course, Stanley Kubrick died in 1999. So I haven't read any biographies. I haven't read the official biography and I don't know very much about Stanley Kubrick. But uh, I gather that he was an extremely talented person who found the right calling and uh, followed it through all the way to the end of his life. And he also, maybe unusually, I think, uh, as a filmmaker, he very early on in his career, he managed to find himself in a situation where he had almost total control of his films. Um, maybe that sort of thing doesn't happen anymore you know, until the, uh, the, you know, the movie companies start you know, seeing numbers coming in. 
But um, it was relatively early on that he um, sort of had complete control and was allowed to do whatever the heck he wanted, more or less. It was. I think he he complained and just simply became so incredibly difficult to work with that anyone who was opposed to the direction his films were taking um, just simply gave in uh, for a quiet <laughs> life. Uh, but when he very conspicuously did not have full control, he certainly wasn't a happy man. And I did read one anecdote about Spartacus, uh, which he had real difficulty working on because of Kirk Douglas, mostly, who uh, he didn't get along with and who had his own ideas. Uh, so there was quite a bit of friction during the filming. Um, but certainly he shone when he had absolute, total, overbearing and godlike control of every aspect of the film, which, again, it just it just sounds like that would have been very difficult for everybody who uh, who he was working with. So another tortured and torturing genius, perhaps. Um, I don't know the Spartacus story. So the Spartacus is another one of Stanley Kubrick's films. Spartacus, absolutely. It was huge. Um incredibly difficult to film you know it was a lot of location shots uh, a huge number of extras huge cast massive in every every direction uh, and it was extremely difficult for kubrick to retain control over filming and uh, there were a lot of egos on the set um principally um kirk douglas and uh, it was a, a real strain all round, so I gather. But an excellent film nonetheless. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Oh, right. However, I don't think I've seen it. we are talking about the very best of Stanley Kubrick, and I think we're agreed in that that boils down to what we consider to be films that are possible to talk about in one sitting. And his best films are 2001, A Space Odyssey. That was 1968. Uh, a Clockwork Orange, uh, which was 1971. And The Shining... Uh, which quite a bit later, in 1980. Each of these films took many years to film, so I gather. Right. Um, apparently not um, not so with Clockwork Orange. I think I, I read a little factoid that that was actually one of his quicker ones. But maybe we should start then with 2001, which is the first of our, our three. By this time, Kubrick had um, a lot of uh, sway and was given a lot of creative freedom was given a huge budget as well to to create this film and it actually this film started as in the the talks for this it began as early as 1963 which i guess was around the time of maybe sort of space talk between um two sides of the cold war is that where this came from you, would you say yeah i think that's fair i think the cold war and the space race uh i think these were kindling for the realization of an idea that he had probably had had since the 50s uh but i think he mm. thought the time was right and the technology was there uh and uh, and the budget was there for him to try and to try and uh build the project uh which, yes. which certainly took uh, many years so it sort of started out as this very short little booklet from arthur c clark who is a hard science who was a hard science fiction writer um, which I've read. It's only like a few pages, I think. It's, uh, it's a very short story. Do you want to just give us the uh, synopsis? Yeah, so it is a short story uh, written by Arthur C. Clarke. I unfortunately do not know exactly when he wrote it, but I gather it was some, some time before the film came out, if not the 50s. And it's a simple story about an alien intelligence wanting to know when a an infant intelligence has reached a certain point of maturity. Uh, so the alien intelligence just leaves a trip wire uh, on the planet or near the planet of the, uh, the intelligence, the burgeoning intelligence of interest. And once that trap is sprung, the alien intelligence is informed and then is able to intervene. So in The Sentinel, uh, we have a strange machine that is sort of like an accelerated learning machine that is able to project images of future technologies uh, that the alien race wishes the infant race to adopt in order to expand its mind. Uh, that's about it. Simple as that. So, so it's sort of a first contact alien story. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, very nicely done, uh, very very concise, and I'm pretty sure that a lot of people watching 2001 for the first time wouldn't get most of that. <laughs> I think I think that's fair to say. That's fair to say. I mean, people famously walked out of the original screenings; so they didn't know what was going on, which was odd because when it was originally put to the the budget men, um, it was actually narrated. There was a a preface to the film explaining everything and what it was about. Um, so. All of the distributors and the financiers were happy. They said, yeah, great, release it. Um, not knowing that that preamble would be cut for the actual official releases. So people really were clueless, whereas the, <laughs> the financiers uh, knew what was going on ahead of time. I didn't know that. Um, well, that's interesting. Now, I watched this film uh, the other day. Um, and for our listeners, uh, just full disclosure, um, I was watching it while I was actually chatting with you, Jeff. So we've kind of had a little bit of a conversation about some of this. Um, and the first thing that struck me was just how long the film is. And this is what I mean about I can well imagine people just not getting that very concise little story that you, you explained. Because what went on in the early part of the film seemed so long ago by the time you got to the end of the film. So it's like kind of trying to recall back of how what goes on at the end kind of ties in with what went on at, at the beginning, say. But it's also fair to say that you and I have seen this film like many times and uh, we've looked into it and, you know, we've discussed and went back and forth. And even up until like recently, until last week or something, we were still sort of a little unsure about some of the details. And so just to, again, give the listeners a bit of an overview of some of the film. So <clears throat> we start off with the the basically it's it's the dawn of man would you say yes indeed the australopithecus afarensis proto humans wake up in the morning to a peculiar sight they see the monolith this is a black cuboid really quite big maybe you know 3 meters tall and uh, it's very strange they touch it and then we have new monkeys the monkeys then have altered brain chemistry. Now they can see that, you know, maybe there's a solution to their starvation. Maybe they can actually change their own circumstances by altering the landscape, altering the environmental variables. Uh, one of them, the moon watcher, the leader of the pack, grabs a bone, realizes that he can use the bone as a weapon, and there we are. We're not starving anymore. We're eating animals. And there's a quick cut to the next scene, which is a spacefaring weapon. There's a satellite which was uh, the brainchild of Arthur C. Clarke. He invented the whole notion of satellites for communication. Um, but this is a weapons satellite, so the link is a bone, and then, you know, a trivial ge geological amount of time later, we have space weapons. And there's the trajectory of the human race. Um, okay, so, so we're in 2001, and um, the dialogue here in this film uh, is kind of kind of hard to follow and this is this is something i noticed when i watched this film recently um was how flat the dialogue was and how long the scenes were sort of unnecessarily i mean the film was already long we have the the monolith inspiring our ancestors into intelligence in order to survive and then we have a monolith being uncovered on the moon uh during the space age so we have reached a level of sophistication whereby, you know, minor space travel is possible. We're able to get to our moon. We find this magnetic anomaly, dig, find an, an, a monolith. Uh, and then this is big news because it very clearly seems as though it is some sort of alien artifact. Although no one ever mentions this. It's, no one ever says it's an alien artifact. No one mentions it's an alien artifact. Aliens are never mentioned, uh, which is interesting. Well, no, it, it is kind of alluded to when they're. You know, it's alluded to, of course, it's alluded to, but they never actually say this is an alien artifact or there are aliens when they're all sitting in whatever lunar rover or moon bus, whatever the hell it was, and they're all eating sandwiches, and the scene goes on for like fifteen minutes, and they're talking about how sandwiches are getting better and. <laughs> all this other stuff all stuff that should have been on the cutting room floor as far as i'm concerned they're looking at these photographs of the monolith and they did say something like well we don't know who made it or we don't know where it came from and that's all true but haywood floyd never says aliens it could they could be talking about anything 
He does not say aliens when he's on the little when they're on the moon bus traveling out to the yes. the actual site where the monolith has been discovered. They say deliberately buried. Haywood Floyd repeats this deliberately buried. Oh, that's it. Deliberately they do not buried. say aliens. Yes. They don't mention aliens ever. Okay, which is interesting. Well, well, why is this significant? I think it's significant because that's odd. I mean, <laughs> in any movie that were to be made now, you you that would have been made explicitly. That would, that would have been confirmed to you in the dialogue. But for some reason, they don't. And I think this led me on at a very young age into ideas that perhaps this is allegorical. Maybe this is a metaphor for something. So, and, and, and it, it could well be. I mean, there are lots of theories floating around, but I, I found it interesting that, you know, it seems obvious that it's an alien that we have, uh, we, we've made first contact. And of course, that's the theme. I mean, once they've discovered the monolith on the moon, they then tracked somehow that um, high energy radio burst towards Jupiter. And then the next scene, we have the discovery spaceship on the way to Jupiter to find out what it was that that monolith may or may not have been communicating with. So perhaps in the interim, they actually visualized in some way some other object that's near Jupiter. Um, but the idea is this is a first contact situation and, uh, it's a voyage of discovery. So a fairly, you know, a, a meat and potatoes sort of science fiction, uh, concept here. I don't think there's anything new in the idea, but I, I, I really enjoyed the really long scenes and the attention to detail in the scenes and the focus on everyday matters that are interesting when considering space travel and zero gravity. I mean, that, that's all very interesting. It's all textbooky. Maybe we take that for granted now. But uh, in 1968, I can imagine, you know, putting a huge amount of thought into what it's actually like to be in a weightless environment or going to the moon. That was, you know, quite interesting to most people because of the age, because of the time. You know, we really were on the, the brink of space travel. So, you know, to have all of that exposited in such a uh, artistic way, I thought was uh, a good idea, beneficial and really interesting. And I, I still find it interesting. We don't have the patience these days to, to handle scenes that, it, that are so seemingly empty and long, but uh, it worked for the time. Yeah, going back to the thing about the allegory, um, you said just then about pretty meat and potatoes, and I think it is meat and potatoes. And I think it's not an allegory. The reason, or the possible reason, that they didn't say it could be an alien that did this <laughs> or something was to not put training wheels on the film, you know, to sort of make people have to think about these things. You know, there's no allegory there. It's just, you know, just you have to work it out. Yeah, I, th I think, uh, yeah, you can look at it in both ways. I mean, I always thought uh, my general takeaway from the film is that it's about evolution. It's the evolution of mind, the evolution of our philosophical outlook on the universe, and evolution in terms of biology. Yeah, but it's it's more than that because it's not just evolution in a sort of self-contained way. It's interference from some more intelligent life form of some description. Yes, yeah, which 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 is all part of evolution in terms of change. You know, evolution has change ignoring the mechanism. So you have the biological mechanism, you have this alien mechanism, you know, diaspora type, uh, panspermia, whatever they call it. In this conversation, you could say that the allegory is God. God um, gave us the initial spark. It, it could be, but it seems unlikely. I and mean, I think, I, I don't know whether or not Stanley Cooper was particularly religious. I, I don't think he was. Uh, he was Jewish, but I don't think he ever renounced his Judaism, nor did he ever confirm it particularly. But I think to argue that we're, this is a, you know, this is about, uh, a higher being, that is to say, a being, the creator of the universe, that sort of breaks down because of how this is all conducted. It's quite mechanical and it's quite comprehensible. So I think, Aliens who are, you know, millennia beyond us in terms of technological development rather than the ultimate power, I think, is more plausible in terms, you know, in, in refer with reference to the story. I disagree with that. I mean, I, I, I don't see why God is off the table. Well, God is always a possibility, but I think it's more plausible that it's space aliens. 
But I, I like the style of the intervention. The style of the intervention is the presence of this monolith. So in the original story, the, the source material, the Sentinel, it was a pyramid and it would project images you know, that you could see inside it or appeared that you could see inside it and it would be some sort of um, epistemological device. Whereas the monolith, it's just a black slab and that's it. You don't get any more insight than that. It's completely enigmatic. And I think that's a, a minimalism for, for style. I think it's just that really is something that has longevity built into it because it doesn't have all the baubles and uh, rainbows that one could have conceived uh, during the filming or during the screenplay. So I think style, style, it wins all the way up until we are on the discovery where the style just continues to impress. It wins all the way up until <laughs> the discovery spacecraft and then it just continues. It keeps yeah. winning. So it has a little break? No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, well, this for me is like the real meat of the film, then. When you have um, these uh, two astronauts, what you call them, or space scientists. I'm not sure what, you, what they are. Well, I think that they're just the mission crew. They're the ones who are getting the real scientists to the deployment point at Jupiter. Yeah, so you've got these two uh, crew members now who are sort of... Um, in control. Actually, I should also say that this podcast will contain spoilers. There's no way it can't. Yeah, we're kind of assuming everybody has watched these movies. Yeah, and plus also, you kind of need to have watched the film to, to listen to this, really, because uh, we're not going to be covering all bases, um, and it requires some sort of background knowledge of the film. And you've all had at least 35 years to watch all of these films. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, these, so these crew members. Um, now, also on board is this computer and this is probably the most sort of iconic part of the film and bear in mind that this is 1968 as well and so um some things are like wow pretty uh, spooky how well they've called them and other things are clearly well it's 1968 and so this computer is called hal what would you describe this computer as jeff i would describe it as a heuristically programmed algorithmic computer <laughs> of the 9000 series and it is foolproof and incapable of error. Indeed. It is an artificial consciousness. Now, artificial consciousness has been discussed in philosophical circles for hundreds of years. So it's just the culmination of philosophical thought on the subject. And it's manifested as this um, bo disembodied voice, basically. Now, for reasons which we might go into, it would appear that this computer seems to start making mistakes. And the two crew members who are portrayed as being very unemotional. Consummate professionals. And highly, highly trained. Yeah, highly, highly trained, best of the best, which is why they are involved in this mission. Earlier in the film with Haywood Floyd, he spoke about this cover story. Now, a cover story still exists on Discovery 1's flight to jupiter there seems to be contradictory information that was given to hal and hal being a binary computer doesn't know how to interpret this and then so starts to break down is one way you could look at this i think it's a completely reasonable way to look at it i think this is this is a foolproof and incapable of error computer that is programmed not to distort information and facts and it is told to deceive the the two mission operatives who are um, unaware of the real genuine massively critical and important nature of the mission uh, this is a problem he's a conscious entity and he's going to have a problem with this the two crew members start getting a little bit worried that hal is starting to make mistakes and so they devise a plan to disconnect how i think they call it disconnection yeah they they conspire to shut down his higher brain functions and keep all of the life support systems going hal is fundamentally a computer that wants to deliver the truth and the facts and is absolutely therefore incapable of deception when he is forced into a position of deception he starts breaking down and you know malfunctioning and it looks as though 
Hal's best strategy to defend the mission is to eliminate the humans. He he just can't he can't handle having to lie <laughs> to the humans. Uh, so it's better just to kill them all. So Hal goes about trying to do exactly that. Um, but he's scuppered uh, and he is eventually shut down. And that leads straight into the final scene of the film, whereby we rendezvous with the final manifestation of the monolith. And uh, this scene is known as the Stargate scene. This is where the surviving crew member, Dave Poole, um, Bowman enters. Sorry, Dave Bowman. Uh, Poole is dead, unfortunately, as are the rest of the crew. Uh, Dave Bowman enters the Stargate, this uh, monolith, and he goes to somewhere else. Could be another dimension, could be somewhere else in time. Who knows? But wherever he is, he goes. He is no longer in the universe that we are uh, are living in. And I think that's a, another major transition in the film. Indeed. So do we just want to uh, like put a cap on it and talk about how the film ends? And then we can go back and talk about um, some of the meat. Okay, so Bowman goes has an experience, which is a very sort of uh, trippy LSD-like experience. Um, and he, he ends up in a peculiar hotel room. Uh, he is aged and he is unable to leave this hotel room, it would seem. There doesn't appear to be a door. And you're immediately thinking, well, what is this about? <laughs> it's, it's a very strange looking room. It's a very artificial looking room. It's obviously all been artificially assembled by some intelligence. And uh, what is he doing? What is he thinking? Uh, it's odd. He doesn't know why he's there at first. He simply appears in, in his little EVA pod. Uh, and then later on, he seems to actually be living in this, this strange room. And he is somehow served meals. It is all incredibly alien. And you may well reasonably think that he is living in some sort of facsimile of the reality that he knows designed by some intelligence that doesn't quite understand all of the um, stimuli that humans need to exist. However, inside this strange hotel room, the monolith appears again. And this time, it is directly in front of him, just as closely as it was in front of the proto-humans at the beginning of the film. And Bowman extends one of his arms... And then the next moment, he is a unborn baby floating in space. Star child. The star child, as it has been known. And that's pretty much the end of the film. So it's very cryptic seeming. There's an awful lot of imagery. There's an awful lot of symmetry. And uh, it's all set to fabulous music, just like all of his films. Well, not just like all of his films, but we'll get on to that. Okay, so... My favorite part of the film is Dave and what's Poole's first name? Uh, Frank. Frank and Dave are um, getting suspicious of Hal. Hal discovers this because um, he manages to read their lips when they're uh, talking about him. And so Hal takes the opportunity to um, sever Frank's life support cord when he's uh, doing his spacewalk and then so he's um, flying around in space and this is actually quite a good moment of the film in terms of just the, the cinematography is just so powerful I find and it's interesting that, that I don't think I've ever seen this done in any other films actually one exception comes to mind and this little device is there's this incredible movement in space because Frank is untethered he's in space and he's just writhing in in flapping around you know for life he's panicking in space but yet there's no sound <laughs> it's just totally silent because of course you know space would be totally silent and so there's a kind of um realism there which i think um maybe arthur c Clarke might have had something to do with it being this hard science writer 
but I find it incredibly powerful. Whereas other films with such a dramatic scene, you would have equally dramatic music playing. No. Um, the only other film I noticed that was film Eraserhead. Um, what's his face? Lynch? Yes. There's a scene in that film where um, the main protagonist on there, you, you see him looking you know, surprised as he always is. And then you cut to him looking surprised, but he has the head of his weird mutant child and it's just silent, but yet he's screaming. And it's a weird kind of silence that makes like the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Um, and so that's what Kubrick did. This is 1968. And I'm just surprised that it, that, that hasn't you know, become like a kind of a uh, trick. It's odd. Yeah, the, the, uh, yeah, a, a mainstay or a standard. In Alien, of course, uh, in space, nobody can hear you scream, but you can hear every other possible sound effect, including explosions in space. <laughs> in 2001, you may hear classical music, um, particularly when the, uh, the shuttle up to the orbiting space station uh, during the docking sequence. Um, but you don't hear anything, I don't think, when Frank Poole's umbilical cord is cut. I think you don't hear anything. I think that is totally no, you silent. Don't. But in other silent. scenes, you will hear whatever, from what, from whom, who's ever uh, a viewpoint you're seeing. So if you're seeing space from the viewpoint of Bowman's eyes, you will hear him breathing. So he's watching you don't hear anything in space, but you're hearing what he would hear, and he would hear his own breathing. So it's yes. very clever. It's well observed, and you know the, the facts are as as you know the facts where they are are quite closely adhered to, and I think with great effect, mm. great effect. So, so Frank is now sort of flying around in space, and eventually dies, and is just floating in space, and then so um, Dave goes out to go and rescue recover um, his body yeah recover his body yeah but again he does it in such a professional way it's like he 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 never sort of like screams or runs like a maniac he kind of very calmly kind of climbs down these um this ladder and then into the uh the pod and then forgetting and his flies helmet. out into space forgetting his helmet yes and then so um so he uh he retrieves frank and then Tries to get back into uh, the Discovery. Discovery One. Um, but Hal is just like ignoring his request to open the pod bay doors, Hal. And I think that's probably another very uh, famous little phrase from the film, open the pod bay doors, Hal. And so Hal is just ignoring him and then eventually says, um, what does he say? I'm afraid I can't do that, Dave. <laughs> and, and then he reveals to Dave that... Um, you know, I, I knew you were going to disconnect me, and this mission is too important for you to jeopardize it. Uh, but Dave then outsmarts him because he um, uses this feature of his the pod he's in, uh, the feature being explosive bolts, to somehow um, burst his way into some emergency pa uh, manual hatch override. Of, yeah, again, th th there's a flaw here, which which I'll get back to that Jeff, you and I have discussed. Dave is now back into the uh, Discovery One, and he's now just walking in a very sort of um, perp walking very purposefully towards Hal's sort of central control, you know, memory banks or whatever it is to go and switch him off. And here is the crazy flip, because you've now got the only emotion in the film is coming from Hal. You know, Hal is like virtually pleading with uh, Dave, who's just like not responding. Um. He's, Hal is clearly uh, perturbed at the possibility of dying. You know, w will I dream? And all this kind of thing. I'm afraid, Dave. And obviously, there's a lot of questions coming into this about whether or not Hal is just pretending to um, um, to sound vulnerable, you know, in order to appeal to Dave, uh, his level of compassion. You know, which you can see that it's, uh, when Dave is actually shutting down Hal's memory... You can see that Dave is re reacting, you know, sing it, Hal, when Hal uh, asks if he wants to hear a song that he learned when he was a, a child computer in 1992 and all this kind of thing. And so I, I think that for me is probably the most memorable part of the film is where we're, we somehow not quite have a lump in our throats, but it's we're noticing we're being moved by a computer. Which, which is a very uh, a powerful 
thought. And I, I think it's one that, that we will arrive at sooner than we think. Um, yes. But I thought if, I thought the reason why Hal was, was, uh, it was important to Hal to survive this and for him to survive and he didn't want to be shut down is because he had to finish the mission. He knew how important the mission was and he knew it's more important than anything else. So he's basically desperate to, to, to fulfill the mission. He kills all of the crew members or attempts to because he doesn't want to jeopardize the mission. It has been drilled into his transistors that absolute, you know, no cost considered, you must fulfill your mission. This is the most important thing. And I can imagine that's what the mission planners, that's what their focus was. You know, I don't care what you have to do. Get rid of, That's why they have so many redundant systems and all the rest of it. Whatever you do, uh, spare no cost, complete the mission. Because it's the most important humans thing that humans have ever encountered. So let's get down to the actual sort of grains of this. So why weren't... Um Frank and Dave told the true nature of the mission because they wouldn't be able to handle it. They would go crazy in the 18 months it takes to get to Jupiter. They would have lost their minds, blown the ship up. Why would they have lost their minds? Because it's too much for a human brain to take. That's why they put the other crew members, the, uh, the rendezvous crew. Uh, that's why they put them in suspended animation because, you know, even before, you know, before the mission, before the, the ship takes off, they're, all, they're, they're, they're packed onto the ship already asleep and Hal questions this he says was not that a bit weird because it's too it's too much to handle what do you mean i mean where, did, is that just your pure conjecture here yeah i think so with with some qualification i think right it's too big a risk to completely fill in the mission crew on the true mission I think I think it's better just to say, look, this is a mission to Jupiter, which is momentous enough to a, in a human psychology. But uh, to then add on to that, oh, by the way, you're going to go and visit God. Uh, you know, that might be a bit much. But it wasn't a bit much for the crew members that were put to sleep. So th- they knew this. Yeah, but they were put to sleep. So they're not a jeopardy to the mission. So they wouldn't have 18 months to, f- to freak out. Exactly. Don't you think it sounds kind of weird? No, that sounds perfectly fine. If you're, that doesn't sound if these people, if you tell the people the nature of the mission and, and, you know, it's pretty freaky, but, you know, they're given time to chill out about it and then you freeze them so they don't have too much time to start thinking about it again and blow the ship up. And then you don't tell the guys, the, uh, technical guys who just make sure the ship actually gets to the destination. I think that sounds reasonable to me. I mean, I'm sure maybe scientifically there might be other ways to do it, but when you're talking about a first contact situation uh, and, and a mission length that's so huge, you know, that's never been done before anyway, and who knows how human, you know, how human brains would take it, you would put all kinds of resilient systems in place and redundancy and all the rest of it. Who knows? But that, that's what I take away from it. Okay. Well, that's interesting. Um, yeah. it's That's one of those little niggles to me that kind of almost gets in the way of the film. It's like, well... Well, why? Well, 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 why? And also, the other question I had, which you and I discussed, was I was figuring that it would seem quite arbitrary that uh, Hal suggested that the AE-35 unit had malfunctioned. Uh, the the AE-35 unit just happened to take out the main communications array pointing to Earth. And by taking it out, Earth couldn't be notified by any shenaniganry that went on. No, but I thought they replaced it with one that worked. Um, while they took it out, they had radio silence. Oh, okay. Which I, I thought was an amazing scene. Technologically, I thought it was unbelievably awesome. Because they're looking at it, and it's showing you live sort of x-ray images. Yes. Uh, while they're rotating it in their hands. And I just thought, now, come on. <laughs> That's incredible yeah. technology. And it was really well done. Of course, all of the screens that you see are not you know, the latest AMOLED flat screens, they are just projection screens. So everything's back projected. So these are just plastic squares that they have projectors behind projecting hand-drawn computer graphics onto. Yeah, but it's still pretty awesome, though. I mean, that's amazing. I mean, it's it's mind-blowing. Probably up until maybe only 20 years ago, I think, if a screen was being showed in, in, in a science fiction film, it was probably still a CRT. Whereas in 2001... 
the, the the makers of that film knew that CRTs, you know, how many how many shows were, were there in the nineties where on the spaceships the screens that they looked at were CRTs? Yeah, it, well, that, that's the point I'm making, and um, a lot of other people have noticed this, and I, I I saw this when I watched this the other week. Is they totally called the iPad Pro because they were both watching BBC Twelve on their iPad Pro, and it really was. He was carrying it like an iPad. He had it on the desk. They didn't call the iPad Pro. They made the <laughs> iPad Pro happen. Yes, that's one way of looking at it. But there are other things, which is like, oh, well, they got that wrong. They got that wrong. But overall, what, the, the film is such a marvel to watch because of the style of it. And I think the reason why it's lasted, and it's, it, it's a lot of it isn't really that dated. It's because they kept things clean and simple. You keep things clean and simple, and they're just timeless. And I think that film is quite a good example of that. Yeah, I thought it was. I, I, I thought the things I liked about it were I liked the enigma. I liked thinking about what things could mean. Um, I like the idea of the the monolith and how it looks like the movie screen. It, it is a film screen. Look at the dimensions. When it goes sideways at the end, uh, it's it's it is the film screen that you're looking at. That's that's the secret of the film. The secret of the film is that Stanley Kubrick is showing you the film screen that you're looking at. That is the monolith right at the very beginning of the film when the screen's just black and you're looking at that aspect ratio and then you see the monolith and then later on you see the monolith you think hang on a minute hang on a minute a big black rectangle that's the film screen that's what he's trying to tell you (laughs) the monolith is the power of cinema and uh and it's a recurring theme all the way through the movie you know slowly Slowly that screen rotates and rotates and rotates until it's perfectly sideways, just like the cinema screen you're, you're watching it on. And also there are points where it's like a door, a doorway, you know, when it's standing in front of um, Bowman's uh, bed uh, when he's in the hotel room dying, when he, just before he becomes the star child, it's a doorway. It's, it's right in front of his bed. And there, are, there aren't any doors in that room, but now there is. It's the monolith. You have to go through Jesus. You have to go through the monolith to get to the next big jump in human evolution. And I love all that stuff. I think it's great. I think it's full of meaning. It's open to interpretation. And it's just so cool. It's such a cool film. Yes, I agree. I always kind of am a little bit reticent to recommend it to anyone because it's a kind of film where if you just watch it on the face of it, it's really kind of hard to to get a handle on. And plus the length as well. But um, it's worth persevering. Yeah, absolutely. It's an absolute total classic. What you just said just there, I didn't even realize. I mean, I, I didn't even notice that there wasn't any doors to that room. And I, and I didn't even think that the monolith could be seen as like a doorway. So, I mean, that's an interesting little layer there. Um, and I think that's sort of Kubrick all over. It's like there's so much attention to detail. And there's probably like, you know, half of the stuff that people don't even notice. And it only takes re- repeated viewing and lots of sort of navel gazing and chin stroking to kind of um come up with this stuff well, it's one of the very few films that i can actually watch again most movies i really honestly don't ever want to watch again and there are very few films that i can watch again and again and the next film we're going to talk about is another one of those films i think we should move on to a clockwork orange did you say you would watch it again yes okay these three films by stanley kubrick are certainly films that i can watch again no problem oh, okay that's interesting all right, so yeah, I watched uh, Clockwork Orange um, the other night. It's on Netflix. Um, Jeff, do you just want to give us the paragraph? Sure. Now, I haven't, uh, I haven't actually watched A Clockwork Orange for many years, but I have seen it many times, so I know it fairly well. I've read the book by uh, uh, Anthony Burgess, uh, sort of a novella. It's not a very long book. It's very, very, very good. I thoroughly recommend it. It's really excellent. I do mean to read it again. Um, there are some fairly significant differences between the book and the film, but overall, it, it completely captures the uh, the themes. Uh, but this is a 1971 film, and it stars uh, Malcolm McDowell, and he is playing a miscreant, violent uh, member of the Ute in some kind of semi-dystopian future just around the corner. And uh, he roams the neighborhood in a gang and just partakes in um, uh, episodes of uh, ultraviolence on uh, 
hapless um, passers-by as well as uh, other similar foes. And it's just a, uh, a story about... I mean, I see it as a battle between collectivism and individualism. That's my takeaway from the film. Uh, it's also about the effects of uh, personal intervention. The differences between personal interventions and state interventions. Uh, it, it seems, it comes across to me as a black comedy, and I think perhaps maybe the in, original intention was to be a bit of a black comedy. Uh, at the time, I think it was not seen as a black comedy. I think more now it is, because we're used to really violent films. I mean, there's almost no blood in uh, in uh, A Clockwork Orange. Uh, and it was highly well, controversial at the time. <laughs> but there is not, <laughs> I mean, c- compared all. to ultra-violent films now, there's there's very little blood in it. Honestly, there's very little blood. No, I wouldn't... No, that's, <laughs> I, I watched it the other night. There's plenty of blood. And the uh, and it was very controversial when it came out, and yes. uh, it wasn't long before it was... Uh, I mean, it had an X, X rating because of some of the violence and some of the nudity, um, some of the scenes. I think uh, Stanley Kubrick, there's a sex scene in it where Stanley Kubrick sort of um, fast-forwarded the action and uh, had William Tell, a fast-forwarded sort of William Tell overture playing, and just to get around the film censors, uh, which sort of worked, but ultimately it was it was X-rated, and it was even removed, as you mentioned. It was uh, taken off the UK film circuit because Stanley Kubrick and his family started getting uh, death threats, and also I think there are some copycat uh some copycat events, uh, some violence happening out there. So I think it was just removed. Um, but it's it's completely available now in its entirety, and uh, I thoroughly recommend it. I thoroughly enjoyed it. I thought it was fantastic. It's definitely one of my favorite films. Okay. Um, well, I watched this film the other night, and unlike um, 2001 and The Shining, you know, I don't actually know um, much of the background of the film. And, you know, I haven't sort of... Uh, read all the geeky sites which talk about you know what all the imagery means and what the kind of commentary is you know the the social uh, commentary the political you know machinations and you know the, the the statements that it's making and all the rest of it i just simply watched it as a film you know I, I took it on its face value and i actually think it doesn't work that well sort of on its face value i i think it's kind of flawed in ways which which we'll talk about and unlike 2001, the film is just dated because it didn't do what 2001 did. You know, it's very much a snapshot of, of um, 1971 in many ways, you know, just in terms of the styling and the decor and things like that. And the music is probably the worst part of the film because in 2001, you know, there's, it's beautiful, these, uh, these scores that you use. You know, you got some quite well-known pieces like the uh, Blue Danube and then the lesser well-known pieces, which are just gorgeous. But on this... Ar- Aram Kachaturian's Gayan Zadasio in particular. Yes. That sequence with the discovery and the, the star field and that yeah, yeah. stunning can, music. Can, can, can you sing that little bit? Oh, it goes. Fantastic. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's just gorgeous. Whereas this Clockwork Orange is just such a sort of, as I say, snapshot of 1971 because you have these horrible sounding analog synthesizers <laughs> just murdering these classical tunes. You know, it's obviously the uh, the main protagonist. He has this interest in Ludwig van. He has this thing about the ninth. Uh, you know, which is which is fine. But then you hear it being performed by this. Uh, what was the name of the guy? Carlos Walter Carlos. All right, he, he he's this guy who had all these synthesizer sort of adaptations of very famous classical pieces, and this film put him on the map. I know about this because he he's very well known. Um, you know amongst musos and stuff he's actually a woman now <laughs> did you know that i didn't know that no <laughs> anyway but i i think the film suffers because of it it's just I, I disagree i think it's fantastic it just adds to the style it's a very stylish it's 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 a period piece in that it's very stylish it has a lot of accoutrements of fashion you know deliberately so kubrick he can't you can't do anything about that i mean it's just this Fashion is fashion is fashion is fashion, and the world that he could have been depicting may well come back again. Who knows? It may look exactly like that in 2100. Who knows? Fashion is fashion. There's nothing you can do about it. Whereas in 2001, you can, you know, it, it's, you can, you can become so utilitarian and just stick to the actual focus of the film that you can actually make it look 
uh, contemporary, even, you know, 40 years later, because it doesn't have fashion in it. But if you have to have fashion in it for the story, then go all out. It doesn't matter. And I thought the music was fantastic. It suited it perfectly. And uh, I love the idea that Alex, um, the leader of the pack, was, you know, he was deeply moved by beauty, you know, his perception of beauty and what he thought was beautiful. Uh, he was really interested in aesthetics. Uh, and, and also he was really interested in violence. <laughs> and I think, you know, having those two on the same footing uh, made a statement in the film. But. Well, I, well, I'm sure it did, but again, I don't really think it worked. And just going back to the whole styling things, yes, I completely agree. 2001 is just clean and simple, timeless. This not. It just looks so dated. Which is not, but it's not necessarily a bad thing. I don't. So another reason why some things don't date is because they don't go away. I think 2001, because it's sort of been a sort of constant throughout my whole life. It's like it doesn't seem like a 1968 film. Whereas because of Clockwork Orange, I've maybe seen it once about 10 years ago, and I just saw it now. It just seems dated. It's the same kind of analogy I but can you, draw. You're taking to. the pejorative with dated. It's a period piece. Okay. Yeah, all right. Fair enough. Um, and also, it's just so long, this film. It's like I was watching it for ages, ages and ages. And then I went and just moved the mouse and saw that I was only halfway through the film. It's like, oh, God. <laughs> What's going to happen now? It's like so much stuff happens in the first half of the film as well. It's it's a kind of film where I think um, Kubrick, he kind of let the uh, what the, the the statement that the film was making kind of get in the way of the film itself. And there were just bits of the film which were distracting in that they just didn't work. Um, and I can talk about these now and you can tell me what you think. Well, that- well, I think we should just, just, just describe just a, a plot overview. What, what was the whole film about? Again, we're automatically assuming everybody who's listening to this has seen these films. But what what did you think it was all about? I shall try and describe it as best as I can. So, yeah, it's a dystopian view of the very near future, as I think you probably already said. I think to me, for me, the film was about a young man who is a menace to society. He's a, a real problem and he needs... And the state, it's in a world where the state takes responsibility for human behavior. And there is several views that are taken with trying to deal with antisocial behavior. One is just to put them in prison and throw away the key. Uh, Another one could be some kind of capital punishment. Uh, Another view could be a bid for rehabilitation. So this young man is enrolled into a, this young murderer is enrolled into a pilot program to try and rehabilitate him. And the rehabilitation doesn't fully work, um, not least because there are more liberal-minded influences sticking their oar in and trying to argue against such coercion. So there's a a liberal wing who are saying, look, you can't do this to people. You can't change the way they think in order to rehabilitate them. That's the worst thing you can do to humanity. It's better if you just acknowledge who they are, give them their their own mind and lock them up forever. So it's really the the 1984, um, you know you're being tortured versus the um, brave new world, uh, you'd rather take the happy pill and not know anything. So it's that sort of liberal versus uh, individualistic and conservative approach uh, with a lo- with a, a heavy dose of um, state uh, intervention thrown in, which is as which was an argument at the time. I mean, certainly in the the early seventies, it was a, a nightmare of trades unions and uh, large government and major interventions. And yet, the, you know, the social ills were still all there. But, uh, you know, how do you deal with antisocial people? I think that's generally what the film and the book was wrestling with. Mm. But there are kind of overtones of, like, a, fa- a corrupt fascist government and things like that in the film. And there's quite a lot of nods. It's funny, you see, it's funny you see it that way, because I see it that way as well, but it's a socialist government. It's socialism socialism and it's the fascism of socialism that we're seeing okay fine all right but 
fine, all, all of that. But, but part of the problems that I had with the film was just some stuff that didn't work. And one thing was the main protagonist and his uh, droogs would, uh, would go and get loaded on milk and um, drive around and cause havoc, real thuggery. And so they went to some quite affluent looking house and uh, knocked on the door, and the lady that came to enter the door, you know, th- through through the door, you know, asked, you know, who is it? And it was like, oh, um, excuse me, miss, there's been a terrible accident outside. Can we come in and use your, tel- your telephone? And then she was like, oh gosh, I don't know. And then her husband says, oh, of course, you better let them in. And then let them in, and then they just like horrifically raped her and beat this guy, um, you know, almost to death, and all this kind of thing, right? Now. The next crime that they commit was they go and do pretty much the same thing to this crazy cat woman. So they go to her house, uh, knock on the door, and through the door they say, oh, excuse me, miss, there's been a terrible accident outside. Can we come and use your phone? She then goes, she, she tells them to go away, and then she goes to the phone and says, hello, police. Someone's at my door, and they, they've just said some things. And it sounded very much like the crime i heard about on the news or read it in the newspaper that th- the, the cops said so the crime that they committed previously was reported to the cops right and this, yes. the whole the whole story about um their confidence trickster uh, approach of saying oh please help us has been an accident right so the cops yes. knew that and then yes. so he killed the cat woman the cops came arrested him why didn't they put two and two together and realize that it was also him responsible for the other crime as well? And I'll tell you why. It's because parts of the film wouldn't have made sense. <laughs> Which parts of the film? Well, so when he's so after he goes through this uh, aversion therapy and he's let out of prison after two weeks, you know, he, and he's he's a murderer. So he's, you know, he's been in prison for two years, and then for two weeks he goes on to this aversion therapy course, and then he's deemed to be cured, and so he's let back into society. Um. So he gets beaten up by his, uh, you know, erstwhile friends, the the droogs, who are now cops, and uh, he's driven to some, you know, remote place, and then almost drowned in like a uh, some kind of horse trough. So then he crawls to this house, and it happens to be the house where he committed that first crime, and the guy originally didn't, um, you know, didn't recognize him and stuff. Actually, I should back up a little bit here and say that um, when he was when he was then let out of prison um, after this two weeks aversion therapy, and his you, you saw all the newspaper headlines that are all saying you know cat murderer set free cat murder. They all talk about cat murder. They didn't talk about any other murders. Uh, I mean any other crimes. And towards the end of the film, after he's seen as having tried to commit suicide but failed, and now there's just been this big, huge uproar about the ethics of aversion therapy and whatever the name of this... Um, Ludovico technique. Yes, th- that's it. The kind of... Uh, the minister of the interior comes and, s- and speaks to him and says, oh, there was someone who, um, who thinks that you, you wronged him at some point, but don't worry, we- we've contained him. And so this is the kind of, you know, f- the, the fascism of socialist, you know, like almost like Nazi Germany corruption here. But the fact is... He would have known that he did commit that crime. Why? Why would he have known that? Because, because that crime was reported to the cops. The cops knew about it, and yeah. then they didn't know it was the same person committing both crimes. But why wouldn't they have put two and two together? They did the exact same thing, said the exact same thing, and almost certainly would you know he'd match the same description. Well, maybe, maybe not. Clearly not. Well, anyway, it seems to me that uh, if you think about it too hard, it kind of gets in the way of the film's narrative. And for me, that was just such a glaring thing. It's like, I, don't well, think it, I don't think it gets in the way of the narrative. I think it may be a problem, maybe, <laughs> but it doesn't get in the way of the narrative. You know, they didn't pin him to that crime when clearly it like happened like the next day and it was the exact same, uh, you know, wording that he, he used to get inside the person's house, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So that didn't make sense. And what also didn't make sense was clearly in this dystopian future, there was still like a criminal justice system. You know, there are still police. You know, she called the, the crazy cat woman called the police. The police came and they arrested him. You know, he would run away from sirens and stuff like that. So there, there are police. And so there still is some kind of um, moral zeitgeist, which is appalled by things like crime and violence. So he is a cold-blooded murderer, right? 
Yes. Although, uh, well, you may, maybe it's manslaughter. You might not have meant to kill the Catwoman. Fair enough. But he killed the Catwoman. He's a murderer. And then suddenly at the end of the film, because he tried to commit himself, now he's like a hero. And it's like at the end of the film when the Minister of Interior says, oh, and we've, we've got a surprise for you. And then these two guys bring in these loudspeakers for Beethoven's Ninth. And then you have all these... Um, uh, photographers like press photographers come in and take photographs and he's all smiling with the minister of interior like waving as if he's some as if he's not a murderer and that didn't make any I sense i think that's the point no no that's you, the point on, of the whole no, film jeff, jeff no you say that's the point but the fact was that throughout the whole film we're constantly seeing newspaper headlines talking about how appalling that this person is because he's a murderer when he went back to his parents home and there was a lodger there and his lodger like went off on him saying you know i know what you've done you know you're this filthy drag and all this kind of stuff and when he went, he was walking forlornly on the, you know, on the bank of the Thames and this, the old guy who he beat up at the start of the film was like, it's you. And then all his old, you know, all the bums, bum friends came and gave him a really hard time. And then the cops came and rescued him and stuff like that. So clearly, if you're a murderer, you're a bad person. So how can suddenly at the end of the film, he's this murderer, but he tried to commit himself and what, all is forgiven? Yes. The point well, that of the film. doesn't make any sense. <laughs> well, let me explain to you. The point of the film is that Alex becomes the victim. He is the victim of this horrific dehumanizing process that the socialist government has cooked up in, in, in a, with a view to rehabilitate offenders. So it's not an individual tragedy. It's a tra tragedy for society. So the man who was the, the first event where uh, the woman is uh, raped in the country house with the writer um, watching, the writer husband. Um, that, that writer is meant to be a real liberal thinker, somebody yes. who really cares about, the, about inner city poverty and crime, doesn't actually live in the inner city or you know, experience any of the crime, is far away in the nice countryside, but really, really tries to convince you that he really cares. Uh, so on a sort of theoretical level, he's really interested in ethics and human rights and that you know, big government is bad, uh, you know, no one should be hurt and everybody is the same and we shouldn't discriminate and you know, a dangerous liberal. Whereas Alex is a, an individualist. He is out for his own gain, whatever that might, may be. He's focused on the moment. Um, and he's not taking into consideration the, the, the wants or needs of other people, particularly. It's, it's all about him as an individualist. And, uh, his victim, the Dr. Alexander, is appalled at this government program to brainwash offenders and petitions to, to, you know, expose it and uh, destroy it. And he pities, you know, his, <laughs> this, the, the rapist and I think potential murderer of his wife. I don't know if she dies or kills herself she, later she, on. She does die. Well, she <laughs> dies, she dies after it. And yeah. the, the writer thinks that, you know, it, the, the, the death was linked. Yeah. So, I mean, potentially he just may, he may be in denial. You know, it may just be too awful for him to, him to put two and two together. Uh, well, the writer eventually recognizes that it is yes, the same yeah, guy. Yeah, absolutely. And then loses it. Yeah. Yeah, but, that's right. Uh, but anyway, he's not... And he, that, he just way overacts, that guy. The, the writer. If you watch it again, he just, he just goes over the top. I think Malcolm McDowell. Patrick I think McGee. Was, That's great. was that Patrick McGee, the old yeah. guy? Yeah. He's, he was terrible. I honestly thought he was terrible. He was just like very, um, very just very bad acting. <laughs> I thought Malcolm, Mac Malcolm McDowell was good, although I just didn't like his smirking face. He kind of looked like Robbie Williams. Um, so that kind of distracted me. Stanley Kubrick certainly thought Malcolm McDowell was f absolutely fabulous. He, abs he wanted him at all costs and had to have. Malcolm McDowell, he was so stunned by his uh, previous film, if. Um, if, which was brilliant. After A Clockwork Orange, and Malcolm McDowell, he just had nothing more to do with Malcolm McDowell, and Malcolm McDowell was really hurt by it, that he just like disappeared. And that's part, that's, that, that's part of the um, near-autism level of, uh, of Kubrick and his um, 
you know, the, the way he was. But anyway, so, I mean, I don't think what you've explained there sort of covers such a hole in the film because it just seemed... Yeah, but he, he turned from a, you know, a violent uh, assailant into a helpless victim. So, you know, the 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 total disparity between those two extremes uh, maybe just, you know, flipped his mind. It's uh, no it's doubt too, it's there are of a stretch. continuity it, it, it problems. It, it no, just, it's not. It's not that it's a continuity error. It's, what? It didn't bother me. It, did, it just didn't bother me. Well, I mean, you can kind of pretend that problem isn't there, I guess. I'm not pretending the problem. I'm not pretending that the problem's not there. It probably is. I haven't seen it for a very long time, but it, it wasn't something that stopped me enjoying the film for sure. Um, okay. Okay. Well, that's fine. For me, it was. It, it was just sort of, un, it just didn't make any sense. It's like, well, that, that doesn't make any sense. You know, the writer's muscular assistant who helped him around in the wheelchair? Julian. That was Dave Prowse. He signed my arm once. So, who, who is he? Bit of trivia there for you. Dave Prowse. Darth Vader. Oh, the Green Cross Code guy. Yes. Oh, right. Yeah, he's Green certainly Cross a Code dude. Vader. Yeah. Um, anyway, so the film itself, so as I say, I was watching it on the face of it. Um, and uh, it's, yeah, it's certainly violent. And it's a, it's a certain type of violence, which is pretty disturbing. It's not, it's not Hollywood violence at all. It's kind of quick and dirty and uh, gruesome and pretty graphic as well. Certainly less blood. Ah, uh, there's quite a lot of blood in it. Maybe you should watch it again. I think so. Is that I barely remember any blood. No, at all. there, there's definitely blood. Where, in it. where precisely? We had the rape scene right at the very beginning, the the near rape scene in the abandoned theater. Oh yeah, that's um, right. And then we had all the beatings and kickings during that scene, and there's no blood in that at all. Uh, and then we had the rape scene at the writer's house. There's no blood in that. Um, I'm trying to remember where the blood was. Okay. The blood was well for start. Um, he cut Dim's hand. Oh with yeah, a knife. This, which which didn't cut through the cables, as he said. Didn't says. cut through the cables, but it's still blood. Uh, when he was arrested, he was beaten by the cops. There's plenty of blood there. Plenty. Plenty of blood there because okay. the other cop went out to get a bunch of napkins to throw at him to wipe all his blood up. Mm-hmm. When he was sitting in his uh, chair with his uh, eyes pinned back and forced to watch the screen we were watching this guy get beat up beat up there's tons of blood there. oh in the film <laughs> yeah yeah in that film yeah there's blood yeah, yeah. it's black and white though isn't it no yeah i don't it's remember color. that because the blood was really red and fakey looking but that the, the man who is dripping keeping his eyes moist keeping as a real doctor <laughs> yeah, it, was yeah. Re- it was from the eye hospital uh, a real yeah. real guy that's quite interesting apparently normally when you have that procedure uh, you're lying completely flat on your back so it's particularly difficult when you're Oh, really? Sitting up like that, apparently. Oh, yeah. That was pretty gruesome, that. Um, it was. That, that was um, one of those rare instances, instances where I think an actor actually is, uh, is actually suffering. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can imagine he was. Anyway. But he was, being, he, he was having a version ther- therapy, this Ludovico technique. Right. Against uh, the idea was is that you see violence and you feel ill. He was, yes. The drugs he had... Uh, you know, they're associating the illness he felt with the drugs with the images that he was seeing. But they made a mistake. Um, the key mistake they made was that they also conditioned him against music because they were playing music at the same time. So well, whenever, he he, yeah, whenever he heard his beloved uh, Ludwig van, he started feeling super sick, mm. uh, which was a terrible side effect for him. Mm. But, you know, he's a murderer after all. But That's yet true. we have so much sympathy for him. He's such a victim. Yes, indeed. He should never have been treated so terribly by the state. <laughs> yeah, well, that's... Well, anyway. Which is the end of the scene where he's, liter- he's literally being spoon-fed. <laughs> yeah, which is... It's, and so that's all fine when you talk about the statement that the film was making, but you just step back, watch it as a film, doesn't make sense. Anyway, and the other thing I just want to say, just in, in closing, is the bits that are played sort of broadly for laughs were pretty kind of boneheaded. It's like, it was almost kind of like... Um, you know, like a carry-on kind of film. <laughs> some of the stuff. And also, there is some real narcissism, which I noticed in the film. When he's going, uh, he, he's, so it looked like some kind of indoor market, like a record store that he's sort of um, walking through. And you see on one of, the, one of these stacks of records, you see on the top, the soundtrack of 2001, A Space Odyssey. Yeah, that was cool. But uh, that whole scene was great, and I think the the I, I thought the acting was outstanding. I thought his his um, sort of uh, 
parole officer. I don't know what you would call him, but uh, the chap who visits him when he's at home off sick. <laughs> oh, yeah, he was good. I liked him. I, th- I liked his acting. I thought it was very amusing. Um, very uncomfortable and awkward in all the right ways. Yeah, let me just stop you there on that one. Now, that was one of the played broadly for laughs thing, which I, which was just so kind of... It was just too much because he was, he was that kind of person who was clearly very angry, but he was being, you know, he was smiling and trying to not let his just fuming anger show. But he was drinking from this cup of water that had these the two Teeth dentures in it. In yeah, it. his, his yeah. dad's dentures. And in it's it. like, it would have been funny if he just didn't notice. Yeah. But then he noticed and he just like way overreacted. Yeah. And it was just like, this bit should have been cut. Maybe, but, but, but I liked... I I thought that was a useful scene in that he's he's questioning evil right to its face and saying, you know, you're 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 a smart boy, you know, what what makes you do these things? Why, you know, you could have anything. But why do you choose to hurt people? And <laughs> he just couldn't get over this. And then later on you see him again when he's actually been, you know, convicted of murder. And he said, you know, that's it. It's, you know, you've you, you, there was potential there. There was a light there. I championed you. At you, what did you do? You know, you, you spit on my face, and then he spits on his face. And I think, you know, that's 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 how it is when you you have to try and help people in you know in a preventative sort of way. Uh, dangerous people, you know, you want to try and believe that they're not going down that slurry channel. Uh, but and when they do, you feel personally let down, and it's a terrible thing. It's a descent, I guess, into um, it's a descent into evil. But I think, interestingly, I think the next film we're going to talk about, The Shining, is a descent into evil. Whereas the character of Alex in A Clockwork Orange is pregnant with evil. You know, he he is evil through and through you know what what what, he doesn't know he's evil (laughs) but he is you know judging him by the effects on others so i think it's it's just a difficult problem that i think is a it's a fantastic topic for the book which is you know what do you do with these people what do you do with with people who want to uh hurt society how do you do it and if you're in a, a socialist world uh you have a problem because it's hard to punish people because you're just going to lean back and say, you know, it's just who they are and, you know, we should help them. And, uh, well, you know, it's hard to help people when they're killing people. Mm. But I thought there were a lot of good ideas. I thought it was super stylish. I loved the music and the use of music. I thought Malcolm McDowell was just, his acting was stellar. He was utterly fantastic throughout. And I love their outfits. Apparently that was Malcolm McDowell's suggestion, the whole uh, white get up with the, uh, jock strap looking things the little defenders um incredibly stylish you know massively influential i mean clearly it has uh, inspired lots of popular culture that film i mean lots of bands and you know art and all the rest of it it's really epic in its proportions as far as uh, inspiration is concerned and, and contra- contributions to uh, popular culture so i think it's massively important uh, and uh, I just, I just really liked it. It was just up my street, particularly. I just thought it was mm. great. You know, there are areas in it that I thought, you know, maybe this is going on a little bit too long. And but overall, um, I thought it was great. I mean, the very first time I saw it, and just the way it begins, it's just a block of color, and you have those uh, synthetic arpeggios and just the typeface and everything about it. I just thought it was fantastic. Yeah, I quite like the title sequence. That piece of music is interesting. All on Moog synthesizers, weren't they? And this, yep. is, this is a fairly fresh sort of instrument. It only came out a few years. Well, no, it's in the middle of the 60s. Late 60s. I think. Yeah, something like that. So not, not too long before the film. But, and of course, we haven't mentioned the, uh, the, the dialogue, the language. Anthony oh, yes. Burgess was quite a philologist, and he really he invented this whole slang. Um, yes. uh, NADSAT, which is sort of a... Uh, a conflation of um, rough Russian and Yiddish. And, uh, you know, there are lots of great words. Uh, you know, uh, Gulliver is a head, uh, Drugi is a mate, uh, Devotchka is a woman. Uh, and, of course, everything's absolutely horror show, which just means awesome. Uh, horror show should definitely be used, I think, in in uh, contemporary parlance. Right. But I thought it was very cleverly done. In the, in the book, you know, there's... There's virtually a dictionary in the book, which describes, you know, a glossary of all the terms that are used, and they're all heavily used. 
but I think the essence of it was caught brilliantly in the uh, the narration, which is all by uh, Alex. Yes, uh, which is very good. But see, he never like, lets go of the NADSAT. This slang language goes all the way to the end of the film, whereas his uh, his grown up uh, droogies uh, have given it up. You know, they become police officers, and you know that was part of their youth, and uh, you know, they they've moved on. But Alex hasn't moved on. Uh, that was quite interesting as well. Generally, loved it. Ah, oh, man. You should watch it again. I will. I absolutely... I, I have it. I have it on Blu-ray, I, as I have as I have, as I I have, have 2001 and also The Shining. And uh, the last time I saw all of these films were when I first got them on Blu-ray, which was many years ago. They were all on Netflix. Uh, not in the UK. Really? Correct. Not in the UK? Not in the UK. Oh, well, you could easily get around that. <laughs> <laughs> by having them on Blu-ray. So m- moving on to our next film. <laughs> so our final film that we're going to talk about, and I realize this is a huge undertaking talking about all three of these films. We didn't really have a particular structure for this. I mean, we don't really, we're not reviewing these films. Uh, we're not, uh, you know, it's not a, a huge exposition of absolutely every scene. It's more just, uh, we're talking about the things that we think we want to talk about and the important parts of each of these films and hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end to sort of tie together perhaps the themes, but uh, we'll see how it goes. So the next film is The Shining. This is a film adaptation of a book by Stephen... I've forgotten his name already. Stephen... You're joking. King. Stephen King. That's the one. Stephen King. <laughs> uh, the film was uh, released in 1980, and I think it's fair to say this is a straight-up horror film. Would you agree? I don't think I've read, I may well have read the book. I'm not sure. I did. I went through a Stephen King theme, uh, sorry, a phase, and I read all of his stuff. But. I wouldn't say it's a straight up horror film because it's, horror film to me is just like a kind of brainless slasher movie. Whereas this is a lot more to it than that. This is much more psychological fare. Well, I think the horror genre is much broader than a brainless slasher movie. I think that's right. a subgenre. I think the genre of horror is really quite wide. Okay. It's from The Exorcist all the way up to, um, EastEnders. Um, so what do you, what did you, I mean, you've just watched The Shining, I take it. So I haven't just watched it, but I know it pretty well. I, what, I, I wa- watched it What do you think ish. it's about? Just the basic top level synopsis. I think it's about a kind of descent into madness. I agree. And with a little dash of supernatural thrown into it. Yeah, I think, again, there's a sort of metaphor, which I suppose you could take when you're thinking about what the film's about, but if you've just watched the film and you know you went to the film and all you've heard about the film was that it's a horror film, I think you might have the idea that it is about a hotel that is haunted and the people who look after the hotel during the winter months are driven mad by it. They are possessed by it and driven mad. End of story. That's it. It is, after all, built on an Indian burial ground. So immediately you think, hmm, (laughs) all of those Indian, angry Indian spirits, uh, the the relatives of whom attacked the builders of the hotel when it was originally erected, uh, are perhaps not having such a happy time uh, existing underneath its foundations. So it's a haunted house story. But yet the film isn't called The Haunted House. It's called The Shining. And similar to Tron, it's a film whose name isn't really like a central part of the movie. Um, yeah. But again, I mean, Stanley Kubrick, he would take things and change them from the source material quite substantially. Now, Stephen King has complained. He would never liked Stanley Kubrick. Oh, really? and he didn't like the film. And he said it was, <laughs> you know, not good. He was not impressed. He thought his book was much better and it was very badly misinterpreted. Hmm. I think he was he was particularly irked by the depiction of uh, Wendy Torrance, um, Jack Torrance, who is the chief protagonist, mm-hmm. played by um, Jack uh, Nicholson. Uh, Wendy was uh, a bit of a weak woman, uh, mm-hmm. whereas in the book, she isn't. And he... Oh, really? Yeah. He took umbrage to that somewhat. But uh, I thought actually the uh, Wendy Torrance character, I thought, did a really good job. And she had quite, quite a major part in the film. Oh, yeah. In the film. You know, she's a, a I thought key, she was great. 
a key uh, character for sure. So, mm. but I think if we start with um, the opening sequence. Mm. So I think Stanley Kubrick does opening sequences pretty fabulously. I mean, really properly, this is a film. You're in the room to watch my film. I have you for a couple of hours. You've paid. I'm, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to go all guns. We're going to do this. And, uh, you know, we're, I'm, I'm going to go crazy. And I thought the, the intro, the music is fabulous, unbelievably. Um, anachronistically atmospheric. I mean, you have a winding road across a beautiful alpine landscape somewhere in Montana. And, uh, you have this really scary, eerie music playing. And, uh, it just, you just think, how can, how can this massive vista be claustrophobic? And yet somehow yeah. it is with this juxtaposed music. Uh, phenomenal. The opening is really good. You know, you, you have seen it cuts to inside the car. Um, you know, you see the, the three characters, the family, Jack Torrance, Danny Torrance, the kid who's maybe five or six years old. And then you have his wife, uh, Wendy Torrance. And, uh, you know, right from in the car, I think this is another issue that, uh, Stephen King had with the screenplay is that Jack, it's Jack Nicholson. You know, Jack Nicholson is kind of a zany, crazy guy. And, you know, he's well known from uh, One Who Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, where he played, you know, a crazy person. Mm -hmm. And he's kind of a crazy person right from in the car scene. So right from the very start of the film, he's kind of already on the edge. Uh, and I think Stephen King, he really did. His, his idea was to depict the disintegration of a normal reasonable person you know, a, mm. a, a descent into madness uh in the uh you know the straightest possible slope uh but right at the beginning in the film of course he's he's already showing the signs even before he's gotten to the possessed hotel so there's that okay i gotta pick up a, f a few things there um i believe i think it's in uh, i think it's in colorado but I don't think Jack actually was the sort I, of I think I think the the Overlook Hotel, the actual hotel that was filmed from the out the ex exterior, I think that is in Montana. Oh, right? is it? Oh, okay. Yeah. But I I don't think Jack was a normal person. I mean, we kind of discover slowly through the film that Jack um I mean, through things that the child has said and things that Wendy has said, we we sort of put the pieces together. And Jack has clearly struggled with uh, alcoholism. He's been very abusive. And there are certain things to suggest that he also sexually abused his child. Yeah, I didn't get that. But uh, he broke his arm once, I think, in a drunken rage of some description. Well, this is getting into it now about um, things like the abuse of his child and stuff. So this film was like the... F well, I should talk about um, how I came to this film. I watched, it, uh, I watched this film about 10 years ago. It was on TV. It didn't really you know, pay much attention to it. About a year ago, I kind of heard some chatter about it, and uh, I kind of watched it again. I watched it online. I watched it. And I thought, well, what was the fuss? You know, what what was the fuss all about here? And then I read into it, and just how rich the film is, and just how much work has been put into it, and all these layers, all the meaning, you know, all the commentary, everything like that. You know, there are just so many websites out there dedicated to like a scene by scene breakdown. And I started to appreciate Kubrick and just how much work he puts into these films. You know, these are true works of art. And then so I watched it again a few times, you know, with this new information about the film. And then the film just totally came to life. The thing about there, about you, you didn't know that uh, Jack had, you know, sexually molested his child. That information can actually be read into the film by the placement of certain objects, you know, pictures on a wall. Um, the symmetry between one scene where Danny is doing something and then you see a scene where Jack is doing something and the whole composition of the scene is exactly the same and certain things he said. It's like, for example, when um, I think the, the child psychiatrist is speaking to Danny because I think Danny's having some problems. I can't actually remember too much about it. But when Danny was kind of talking about his invisible friend, you remember yes that lives in his mouth and all this other stuff and some of the answers that he was given was were, were very um strange if, if you were to sort of like watch that again uh and listen to it it's like you, you could see that some of this is is some kind of uh, alluding to some kind of sexual abuse 
Right. Okay. I didn't pick up on any of that. Certainly, I mean, I'm aware of hidden meaning in the film and also, you know, potential hidden meaning in all Stanley Kubrick films. And he does this generally. And I'm, I've heard about the, uh, the gold room and, um, the federal reserve and, um, criticisms about that, uh, and various other, uh, little bits and bobs here and there. Uh, but I mean, the Jack Torrance character is clearly tortured. Um, he, you know, who knows what his past was like and what his childhood was like. And perhaps, you know, he is, it's a whole cycle of abuse there. But the Danny character, the child, always seems to be completely reasonable. You know, a really nice kid who's completely, <laughs> uh, you know, very intelligent and um, level-headed, um, particularly so, which I thought was quite interesting. But of course, he has the shine. So the shine is some sort of telepathy. It's some sort of supernatural ability whereby you can pick up on souls or ghosts or, you know, vibes or something. But uh, certainly there's a straight up telepathic ability where you can hear someone's thoughts and you can speak your thoughts. But then there's this sort of secondary ability to pick up on ghosts or, or whatever it is floating around, disembodied spirits or whatnot. So there's that element to the film so it's a hotel that's built on an indian burial ground and you have a character danny who comes to this location who perhaps has never been to that location before but also has some sort of supernatural element um of course right at the end of the film we learn that perhaps the jack torrance character had been there before so maybe there's some sort of uh conducted um hereditary hereditary there he'd, he'd always been there <laughs> right, yeah he never left or he was the hotel or something like that but um so there's the shine and we learn about this shine very early on in the film during the introductions and uh, jack torrance the character is has a job to look after the hotel during the down months in the deep winter and he's taking his family along and he thinks he's going to have some time to uh, finish his book finish the novel that he's been which is a typical on. stephen king thing <laughs> Yeah, yeah, should should be in Maine somewhere. Um, but then you know we're hit by pretty scary imagery quite quickly. We have the twins, so there are two twin girls who uh, are pretty scary uh, because they appear out of nowhere at the end of corridors and in the in the games room. Um, so they're scary. We have the uh, river of blood, so we have a big long corridor. I mean the set, the sets, and the the whole in internals of the hotel are fa- i'd love yeah. to go there just looks fantastic all the rooms are absolutely massive you know industrial size kitchen and it's just a maze you know an absolutely huge maze um just outside and it just looks and it's on a mountain and it just looks like god it's such a fantastic place i'd love to visit uh but uh there are lots of these sort of hallucinations that um all of the characters have um and they increase in intensity uh, towards the end. I don't of the think film. We, I don't think Wendy but, uh, has any. I think there's a lot of buildup. Wendy does. Does she, yes. when does she hallucinate? Wendy, when, Wendy sees the fornicating bear, which is a particularly frightening scene. That scared the heebie-jeebies out of me when I saw well, that. Well, well, actually, that is. I mean, not to get too much into this, but you, the angle at which that the person is performing on the bear is the same angle that um, Danny is at when he's brushing his teeth in the uh in the sink and it's it's like shot at the exact same part of the film and i I mean sort of the scene and everything the little little crazy subtle um little attention to detail like that yeah i mean i i sort of wonder how much of that is just been fabricated a lot 9-11 theories i mean there's lots of things like that like um there are repeating patterns a lot of people attest to this who actually worked on the film there are lots of repeating patterns in all of Kubrick's films. For instance, the seven diamonds thing. He has seven diamonds in oh, all really? of his films. You know, you always see it. Yeah, there's seven diamonds in the uh, Stargate sequence in 2001. There's seven diamonds in um, on the doors in Full Metal Jacket. Uh, there's diamonds in uh, the patterns on the walls in 
in The Shining. Uh, you know, lots of repeat patterns. I and mean, when you're a filmmaker and you have such control, mm. you can do these things. So no doubt he, he, did, he did these things, you know. See, well, that's just narcissism. Well, I mean, he's an artist. You know, he's an artist. Lots of artists mm. do that and put hidden meanings and things. I mean, you know, the, the artists who were commissioned by the church in the 15th century would, uh, you know, they, they'd, a lot of them were atheists, but, uh, you know, they needed money. So they would sort of put little hidden mm. blasphemies in their paintings. And no doubt there's lots of hidden meaning in, uh, in The Shining, but I haven't done a lot of reading around The Shining that much. I know it is worth doing and I, I'll, I'll make an effort to do that because as you say, yeah. it just makes watching it that much richer. But yes. on, the, on the first watch, uh, the things that I picked up on were just, again, the style, you know, just right. how the symmetry of the shots and, and, uh, the, the use of music and sound effects and, uh, you know, the, 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 the lingering shots on faces and, uh, you know, and, and giving, giving the actors a lot of time, you know, giving each scene just a lot of time for the actor to just sort of, you know, just be themselves or, or, you know, you keep the camera on the actor so they can film their scene, film their dialogue, but just keep it on them a little longer. See what happens. Mm. See what they do. See if they can do anything. Watch them crumble a little bit. That sort of thing, I think, is fantastic. Famously, um, Malcolm McDowell improvised the Frank Sinatra song while he was oh, beating yes. up the, the writer, um, which was great. You know, give, how is that not more interesting for the, uh, for all the uh, all the people who are involved in the films, you know, not to be so stuck on the rails, uh, which is great. Mm. Even though ultimately they are, because yes, Kubrick was always are. in control, because he yeah. he has uh, control of the uh, cutting room floor. So. Well, I was just going to say about Wendy Shelley Duval was like reduced to just like hysterical tears by Kubrick, you know, insisting on just take after take after take, and. I don't know if this is hypocritical or not, but the um, the scene when she's sort of on the stairs with a baseball bat and she looks just totally demented yeah. and just scared out of her face yeah. because Jack is just like properly turned that into That was Kubrick who's shouting person. at. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That kind of thing. It was like the hundred, I don't know how many takes it was. Uh, I think he, he, I think she also actually really hit Jack um, with the baseball bat or some, yeah. some crazy thing like that. But I, I want to talk about Jack a little bit because he kind of, you know, he, he, he kind of, um, since he got to the hotel, he gets more and more kind of... Um, deranged. Deranged, yeah. And he gets more and more angry uh, and you know, putting everyone sort of like on edge and stuff. I kind of think that Jack Nicholson sort of over- overdid it a little bit. It's just him. Is that controversial to say? I don't think it's controversial. I think it, that's, that's who he is. That's just Jack Nicholson. I mean, right. having said that, I've, I've seen films where he's different and he takes on a different style and a different approach i think he's he's a very versatile actor but he 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 fits this bill best right but i i certainly think he's a very powerful actor and um hugely entertaining i am a fan i think he's great and i thought he was great in this uh it made it made i mean i can imagine for a lot of people it made a fairly dull film more interesting i guess again on first viewing and i i think if you're maybe just after a bit of a kind of bit of a slasher film then yeah maybe it would be dull viewing but i mean the scary scenes are pretty scary and they are that kind of that kind of scary they're kind of chilling like the scene with the the two um the 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 twins and the blood on the wall and and all the other stuff red rum um and all and other little details as well that are kind of intriguing it's like for example when you see things through a mirror and you, you and when you're looking at characters speaking through the mirror then you see a different side of them like a different side of the personalities literally and then so, and so that comes into play quite a lot so when you got this this guy who this is the thing where you're not really sure if it's real or if it's hallucination or what it's like jack manages to find the bar in the hotel which suddenly has this you know bartender there <laughs> who pours jack a drink who's who's been you know dry for however many years but now he's he's drinking again um, and then, you know, it's, it's full of people and all this other sort of thing. But then he bumps into one of the Brady guys and Brady is this name that we keep hearing that he murdered his family Yes, because he, 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 he I think it was him or a relative of his that was also like what the, the janitor or, or the housekeeper. What's his role again? Caretaker yeah, He's the caretaker. caretaker and he killed his family and then he, he bumps into him 
in the toilet. He seems perfectly nice and trying to mop him up. But when we see through the mirror the same person, he suddenly becomes kind of nasty <laughs> and uh, becomes kind of racist and all these other crazy things. It's just weird. And so the film is actually kind of fascinating. I mean, I actually probably don't understand some of the film for sure. It's like, well, what did he mean by that? And so does that mean Jack was there the whole time? And and I guess that's a Kubrick thing. Yeah, that's a Kubrick thing. It's like, um, as you mentioned, when he's in the bar, and the, that's in the gold room. Um, right. When there are lots of people there, suddenly his credit's no good. And they're talking about credit. Oh, he's yeah. trying to use cash and it's again you look around and it's all gold and you think yeah is he talking about the federal reserve system is he talking about banking oh, is this right. is this the subtext we're having here you know before right. the money was okay your credit is good now your credit isn't good um and i just think you know that that could be more um more hidden meaning there but uh it's just just on the level of just the 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 interactions and the surrealism I think you can appreciate it on many levels. I mean, just on the the, the style and the sets and the cinematography alone, and then mm. you have the dialogue, and then you have the interactions, and then you have the horror. And it's, there's a lot there. It's really rich. And as you say, the the moments of horror are really horrifying. The woman in the bath. Um, oh yes. Uh, the you know the children with the axes in their bodies. Uh, the only bit I didn't find, uh, I, the only bit of the film that I really genuinely didn't like, was the very end where he's just stumbling around in the snow, and then the next, uh, the next scene, he's just frozen solid. I just think, well, right. do we need to see him frozen solid? Why, why did we need to see him at all? Why can't he just disappeared in the snow dune or something? It just seemed odd to me. I just, for some reason, that didn't jibe with me that scene. That kind of put a fine point on it. I thought it's like, yep great he's dead <laughs> and they got away in the snow cat so you know that's good did they did they get away in the snow oh, i thought they were rescued i can't remember no, they drove away i know because it's just like a car no but i thought the snow cat um jack went and cut the uh distributor cable i don't remember but i certainly remember the snow cat driving off in the distance maybe it was one of the mm. the uh policemen that wendy spoke to on yeah the radio, i think perhaps. it was i think was it was watch it again but yeah but wendy yeah i i thought she was really great um and as i say i haven't read the book so i don't know what the original character was like uh but i i thought she was um i liked her character and that she was just going crazy but not going crazy like jack's going crazy just going crazy just in just sheer fear and panic and just disbelief and worry and all these other words like that um but the, the shining part of it we, we kind of spoke a little bit about this it just seemed like such a small component to this it didn't really need to even be there yeah i i, I thought the same i thought okay well are they going to develop this no they're not going to develop it well uh, maybe I mean, he, they did I mean, the, and yeah, we the just boy, didn't the boy <laughs> certainly saw things you know he was tuned in but then so right. did wendy so you know i think it got to them all at different stages maybe or whatever it was um but i i still think it's a amityville style you know, haunted house that possessed them. But Jack, I think Jack could shine too. And I think the house was communicating to him. You know, I think he was in some kind of dialogue with the house that we weren't privy to, perhaps. Well, I mean, he was always there or that's what the suggestion is at the very end when it's clearly him standing in a crowd of people in 1921. Oh, I just assumed that he could also shine. And he may have just been a projection from the house or a physical manifestation of the house. I don't know. Right. And I think this is one of the great things about the film is that, you know, this was never absolutely hammered down. Uh, no one really knows, you know. Yes. And I think if you were to ask Stanley Kubrick, and his honest reply would be, look, you know, I'm an artist. <laughs> I meant a few things. I had a few ideas and then I sort of abandoned them. I put some things mm. in I shouldn't have. You know, it's, it's a whole hodgepodge that has become a classic. Doesn't yes. necessarily mean it all hangs together perfectly. Yeah, so Kubrick is one of those rare directors that I would give more credit to than usual directors. Because a lot of times we hear a lot about directors, but they're just working off someone else's ideas. You know, someone else will have written a book, director will make the film. And yet somehow we're all interested in what the director has to say and do. But I think in the case of Kubrick, he actually deserves all the attention being on him. Yeah, it's, it's always either or. I mean, it's Mozart... You know, he based all of his operas on, you know, um, librettos. Uh, but, you know, no one's interested in those. <laughs> it's the music. 
Similarly, the, the Sentinel, I mean, you know, that's... <laughs> it, it, Arthur C. Clarke wrote 2001, the novel, during filming of 2001. Yes. So he's basically trying to ape what um, Kubrick was doing. And it was, it was incredibly difficult for him to I do that know. because Kubrick wasn't showing him all of the final shots. He didn't right. get all the information. That's what enraged Arthur C. Clarke because he... He, you know, he couldn't quite follow it because uh, he was only being shown what Stanley Kubrick wanted to show him. So it was a bit tricky there. It's like um, Ibsen and Pierre Gint. Everybody remembers the uh, the music. Uh, the, the the play was of no consequence whatsoever. So you know, it's a clash of art. But I mean, again, I really thoroughly enjoyed The Shining. It had a lot of. Um, I had a little bit of a. Uh, Georgi Leggetti in it again, mm. which featured quite a bit in uh, 2001. So more yeah. fabulous droning, scary droning for voices, which I dare you to listen to with all the lights off uh, with right. really high volume. So the use of music was just awesome. Um, the sense of atmosphere uh, was well cultivated. Uh, the cinematography generally, you know, the actual quality of the cinematography of mm. the cameras and everything are all f- outstanding. In all three Indeed. films, it's just, wow, That's, that's you know, the lighting and everything about it was just incredible. And clearly, you know, I mean, he was a photographer and he's a super mega geek. And, but there are lots of technological limitations that he had to try and overcome through various right. means. Uh, a famous one in 2001 where they just couldn't get a tight enough shot to get things into focus. And they couldn't have, you know, they had a, such a tight focus. They couldn't have uh multiple objects in in focus he had to play around with that and he used that limitation as a strength um it would be amazing to see what he could do now you know you know if he was alive now and still you know capable of uh, making films what would he right. what would he do with uh you know the uh, peter jackson style technology we have now for films what could he do? I think the most, you know, the re- most recent film he did was, uh, what is his most recent film? I think he did this screenplay. He did a lot of, uh, AI was oh, very who are you Kubrickian. About? Stanley Kubrick. Oh, his last he had film a lot he to worked do that. Yeah. And, and, and he did, a, and he did a lot of, uh, concept, uh, material for AI. Uh, Eyes Wide Shut I enjoyed, uh, but that's for a different discussion. So I think right. generally speaking, they are three different films here that we have 2001 A Space Odyssey. Uh, a Clockwork Orange and The Shining. They are different films. One's kind of horror. One's kind of thriller, social commentary, and one is sort of science fiction, um, episodic, uh, existential, and polemic uh, uh, philosophical overview of the human race. Uh, so quite a trippy should have been yeah, fun, and, but... and trippy for sure. Uh, all works of art, no doubt, and all films that I can very comfortably watch again and again and again and still find gold. Right. Um, but there's a lot in them, and I think uh, I'll do well to uh, do a bit of studying and uh, <laughs> read the various theories on all the films and uh, watch them again. Um, unless there's anything else from you. And we can talk you know, for another few hours on these easily, and perhaps we'll revisit each one of these films individually. Mm. But I think, uh, unless you have anything else. No, no, no. I think that's a good good place to end. We don't know what our next uh, program is going to be about. If you have any suggestions or any feedback or would like some information on previous shows or future shows, please visit our webpage, eclecticist.co.uk. Our outro music this time around is the famous and fabulous Blue Danube Waltz. This is by... Johann Strauss, uh, this particular rendition is performed by a Finnish orchestra, and I'm not going to butcher this pronunciation, but Ritmi Poyat. Oh, uh, you did butcher it. It is made available uh, to the public domain um, because its copyright has expired, of course, and per- the performance is Creative Commons. Um, this is the music that featured during the docking scene. As I'm sure the subtext is quite uh, sexual. A docking scene between the the Earth shuttle and the orbiting space station, which has artificial gravity and contains the Hilton Hotel in 2001 A Space Odyssey. So until next time, enjoy the music, um, send some feedback, and we'll speak to you then. Good evening.